In this video, we're going to look at one-dimensional planar conduction, and we're going to use resistance networks in order to solve those problems. We're going to look at two problems in this video. The first one is simply a planar wall with convection boundaries. We've seen this before, but we'll solve it again directly with resistance networks. And in problem two, we'll add to that wall and look at a composite planar wall, again with the same convection boundaries. We're going to use resistance networks in order to solve the 1D heat conduction heat transfer problem. And all the while, we're going to look at the solutions and help develop our physical understanding of one-dimensional conduction heat transfer. So the first problem, our heat flux through a planar wall. We have the planar wall that we've seen before. It has a dimension of L. We are exposing it on one side to an ambient temperature T infinity 1 with a convection coefficient H1, and likewise an ambient temperature T infinity 2 with a convection coefficient H2 on the, uh, on the other side of the wall, at x equals L. And we're going to want to identify first the heat flux that goes through this wall under these given conditions where the temperature on the left side is 20 degrees centigrade, the temperature on the right side is 10 degrees centigrade. I've specified convection coefficients in 5 watts per meter squared Kelvin on the hot side of this wall. Perhaps that's indicative of natural convection in the home, uh, where it's warmer. And a slightly larger, maybe there's a light wind on the outside, a slightly larger convection coefficient on the outside. We'll arbitrarily give the uh, wall a thermal conductivity of 1 watts per meter Kelvin, and again the thickness is uh, 20 centimeters. We're going to ask three questions. What's the heat flux through the wall, or what's the heat loss from the inside of this, from the warm side to the cold side? And what is the surface temperature TS1 and the surface temperature TS2? In order to start our problem, in order to use our resistance networks, we're going to have to make a certain set of assumptions. So the first assumption is that it's one-dimensional conduction. That means that all of the heat which enters from the hot side transfers straight through to the cold side. There's no two-dimensional, there's no heat fluxes out these boundaries. The heat flux is constant and it moves through the entire wall. We're going to say that the problem is steady, that is, there's no time-dependent term. And we're going to say that the wall is passive, or there's nothing happening in there that is generating any thermal, thermal energy generation. And we're going to say that it has a constant thermal conductivity. The combined effect of all of those assumptions means that the problem is suitable to be solved by resistance networks. So let's start looking at that. It means that we can draw a resistance network from T infinity 1 to T infinity 2 through all of the different uh, thermal resistances in the problem. R1 being our convection resistance on the inside, R3 being our convection resistance on the outside, and R double prime 2 being the conduction resistance through the wall itself. And all of these assumptions were necessary because it means that we're, we can make this analogy with an electric circuit. There will be a heat flux moving through here which is passing through each and every one of these resistors. If it wasn't one-dimensional, that heat flux would change as some of the heat leaked out in another dimension. We perhaps don't have to assume strictly that the conductivity is constant, but when we look at the conduction resistance, we'll have to use a suitable average conduction for that R2, and we need to say that it's constant to be able to interpret the temperature profile through there as a linear temperature distribution, which we'll get with a constant a conductivity. So putting in those resistances are our area-specific conduction resistance, 1 over H1, which we'll use to solve the heat flux. If we wanted to solve the heat rate in watts, that would have been 1 over HA. We don't have the area given in this problem, and so we will solve for the heat flux in watts per meter squared. Similarly, R', prime, R double prime 3, the area-specific thermal resistance for R3 is is the convection on the outside, so that's the same formula, 1 over H2 now for the outside convection, and R double prime 2 is our conduction resistance, again in the area specific form, R double prime, that is simply L over K. In order to solve for the heat flux through there, we know that the heat flux is simply equal to the two temperatures, the difference between the temperatures we know, the high temperature T infinity 1 minus the low temperature T infinity 2 over the total resistance, and because all of these resistors are in series, the total resistance is simply R1 plus R2 plus R3. We can easily implement these equations directly in our Jupyter Notebook, calculating these 
R double primes, the total resistance just being the sum of them, and of course the heat flux through there being the temp difference in temperature divided by the total resistance. If we do that, we directly solve for part A of the problem, and I've written out here, and we'll look at them again later, what each of those individual resistances are. Of course, the sum is just the sum of the three, 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.1 is equal to 0.5, and then the heat flux passing through our wall is 60 watts per meter squared. Now we want to look at solving for the temperatures TS1 and TS2. We have a now a known heat flux passing through our resistance network, and it goes through each and every one of these resistors. And that means that we can look at any combination of these resistors. Not only is Q equal to what we just solved for, T infinity minus T, inf T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 over the total, it's also equal to any combination of these that we want. So in order to solve for our TS1, we can say that same Q is passing between this resistor, and so it has to also be equal to T infinity 1 minus TS1 over R1. Similarly, because we want to solve for TS2, we can also look at this last resistor. And looking at the last resistor then, TS2 minus T infinity 2 over R double prime 3 has to also be equal to that same heat flux that passes in series through each of those resistors. We could look at any combination of these as well, uh, and we'll see that again in the composite wall coming up. So now we have our two equations that we can be rearranging for TS1 and TS2, which are the other two things we're asked to solve for in this problem. Again, <coughs> rearranging this equation, we get an expression for TS1, and of course the T surface 1 is going to be lower than T infinity 1, and so we can see when we rearrange this that TS1 is T infinity 1 minus the heat flux passing through the resistor times the resistance value for 1. Similar TS2 comes from rearranging this equation, and of course it's going to be higher than T infinity 2, and so we see as we rearrange it that TS2 is equal to T infinity 2 plus that heat flux moving through resistor 3. Easily implemented in our Jupyter notebooks and easily solved to print out that the surface temperature at 1 is 8 degrees. So this is 8 degrees, this is 20 degrees. We've had a 12 degree temperature drop between the ambient temperature in the room and the surface of the wall. And similarly, the surface temperature at TS2 is minus 4, the outside temperature was minus 10, and so we've had a 6 degree temperature rise between T infinity 2 and TS2 on this surface. Let's plot this. We know that because of our assumptions, we're going to have a limpid, linear variation between TS1 and TS2 inside the, uh, inside the solid part. And we have some drop in temperature abruptly near the wall, uh, because of that convection process. Now let's look at the relative difference in these drops and make sure that we understand how they make sense, make sure that we can sketch a diagram like this. So I have print, reprinted the values of the area-specific resistances for each of R1 and R2 and R3 here. So we can see here that our resistance 1 was 0.2 Kelvin meter squared per watt, and correspondingly, we had a temperature drop from 20 degrees to uh, 8 degrees or 12 degrees between the ambient and the surface of the wall. We see that the conduction resistance through the part is numerically equivalent, 0.2 Kelvin meter squared per watt, and therefore we see the difference between TS1 and TS2 is also 12 degrees, and we drop from 8 degrees to minus 4. The convection resistance, R double prime 3, is half of that. And we notice that we drop from minus 4 degrees at this surface here to the outside temperature of minus 10 degrees or 6 degrees. So the temperature drop between here, between TS2 and T infinity 2, is half the temperature drop between TS1 and TS2. And that's because the resistance is exactly half that value. Looking at these two convection layers, if I were to ask you to sketch this, let's not say that. Looking at these two convection layers, of course, H2 is larger than H1, and that's why resistance 3 is smaller than resistance 2. And because that resistance is smaller, 
the temperature drop is smaller in this layer versus this layer, which has a larger resistance. Let's now move on to looking at the composite wall. So the problem is very, very similar. I've kept the dimensions the same, but simply added another material here. So now I have a K1 and a K2. And what I've done is said, if we imagine this is our house wall, for example, uh, that we have a little bit of insulation on the inside of that wall. And so I have sort of arbitrarily given it a value which is lower. I've taken half the conductivity. So before we had a conductivity of one in our wall, and now we've added this layer in front of it, which has a conductivity of 0.5. The rest of the conditions are kept the same between these two problems. And now the question is the same, except we have the additional question of what is this interface temperature at the interface between these two solid materials, our insulation and our wall. So as before, the assumptions are identical for exactly the same reasons. Uh, this enables us to use the resistance network that we're going to use to solve the problem in a nice and compact format. Here is our resistance network. It's exactly the same as before, except that we have the addition of a fourth resistance. We have the convection process on the inside of the wall, conduction through the insulation, conduction through the wall, and convection process on the outside of the wall. And we have the surface temperature on the inside, the surface temperature on the outside, and the additional temperature, interface temperature between these two, which we're going to solve for. As before, the convection processes are the same. We now call this R4 because we've added an additional resistor, but R1 and R4 are simply 1 over H1 and 1 over H2 for the convection process. And R2 and R3 are the conduction resistances, so L1 over K1 for the insulation and L2 over K2 uh, for the wall. And as before now, we simply have our Q is equal to T infinity 1 that we know minus T infinity 2 that we know over the total resistance, which because they're in series is simply the sum of the four resistors. Again, easy to put that into our Jupyter notebook and solve for it exactly as before. And now I've printed out the values of these resistors again. Now there are four of them. The total is the sum of the four. And the heat flux through the wall is simply the difference in the known temperatures divided by that total. And we have our answer for part A. Now it has gone down to 33.33 watts per meter squared, significantly lower than it was before we had the insulation. It was 60 watts per meter squared for our first problem, and we've cut it almost in half by adding this piece of insulation in front of it. So that's good. We've reduced our heat losses by adding insulation. And now let's move on to solving for these three unknown temperatures. Exactly as before, because the heat flux is moving through the entire train of series resistors, we can look at it from beginning to end with the known values as we did to solve for our, Q, our heat flux, Q double prime. And now that we know it, we can look at any part of this. Identical to before, we can look at the, uh, to solve for TS1 by looking at the first resistor, where of course that same heat flux is T infinity one minus TS1 over the first resistor. As before, we can look at the last resistor in order to calculate TS2. That same heat flux has to be TS2 minus T infinity 2 over the value of the fourth resistor. And we have the interface one. To look at the interface one, we're going to have to look at two resistors. We can either look at this part of the resistance network here, where we have a known T infinity one, the T interface that we want to solve, and the two unknown resistors. Or we could look at the back part of it and move back from T infinity 2 to get that. I will look at the first one here. And so uh, that same heat flux has to be T infinity 1 minus T interface over these some of these two resistors. So now we can easily solve uh, for these temperatures. Here are the expressions here, simply rearranging this equation and plugging them into our Jupyter notebook. Of course, simple translation of these equations into Jupyter and I can output the answers. Now we see that the surface temperature at the wall on the inside, TS1, is 13.33. The heat flux moving through there has gone down, and therefore the temperature on the inner surface of the wall is higher than it was before. Similarly, the surface temperature of the wall at x equals 2L has gotten closer to the outside temperature, 
because that heat flux is smaller. These two temperatures are closer together. It's now minus 6.67 degrees centigrade at TS2. Using our interface equation that we just solved for, we can solve for the temperature at the interface between these two, and in this case, that interface is at zero degrees. So let's summarize and look at that again. Because of our set of assumptions, we know that the temperature profile is linear in each of these materials. We know that the heat flux going through there is constant, passing through each and every one of these resistors. And we know the value of the four resistors. Knowing these values, we know the relative temperature drop in each of these components. We can see that the resistance, the convection resistance, R double prime one, is half the value of the conduction resistance through the insulation. And therefore, the temperature drop going from the ambient temperature in the room to the surface temperature is half the temperature drop that we see through uh, the insulation. Similarly, we can see that resistance 3, the conduction resistance through our wall, is half the value of the resistance value for the insulation. And so our temperature drop through the wall is half the temperature drop through here. Another way to look at this is to remember that Fourier's law tells us that the heat flux is the conductivity of the material times the slope of the temperature profile. Well, here we have a smaller conductivity. K1 is half the value of K2. The heat flux moving through this material is a constant. And therefore, as we move from material 1 to material 2, U prime prime is minus the conductivity times dt dx. The Q prime prime is a constant. K is changing as we go from K1 to K2. K is going up by a factor of 2. And therefore, dt dx has to decrease by a factor of 2 to keep this constant. And that's exactly what we see. This slope is half of this slope. And finally, the resistance, the convection resistance on the outside, is still one half of the convection resistance on the inside. And so we see that this temperature drop here is one half of the temperature drop here. And so with this information and this reasoning, we can always be able to sketch the temperature profile through any composite material, knowing how the temperature, uh, the slope is going to change depending on how the conductivity changes. And we should be able to tell relative to any of these changes how much the temperature drop is going to be in our convection layers on either side.